So uh, in this, now we're going to go next to part two in understanding T cell immunity. And this is really going to start addressing the subpopulations of T cells that a lot of you are familiar with, Th1, Th2, Th17, and Treg cells, and put it into context. So the first question is, again, uh, there are a very wide array of pathogens, and for each pathogen, you're going to want to have a different type of immune response that's generated. How does the T cells know which response to orchestrate that's appropriate for that specific pathogen? How do T cells, CD4 positive T cells, differentiate appropriately? I wrote Th1 versus Th2, but we'll again expand the Th17 T regs. And how do diverse cytokines transmit signals that mediate divergent responses? And again, people were so enamored with the T cell signal transduction lecture yesterday that people came up to me again and said, We want to see more signal transduction lectures. So we want to know more factors. We want to know more kinases. It just wasn't enough. You know, people can't get enough of signal transduction. So therefore, I put in, you know, a whole unit on cytokine signal transduction to satisfy those people who I notice aren't here today. Okay. <laughs> okay, one second. Okay. So... This is to underline the fact that the response to diversion pathogens require different immune responses. And if you want to use a simplistic analogy, it's kind of like if you have an army, an air force, a navy, a coast guard, or whatever, you want to mobilize the appropriate limb of the armed forces for the appropriate type of attack or defense. So if you have an attack coming in by sea, you want to have your navy go out. If you have an attack coming in by land, you want to have your army go out. Uh, so, and clearly, if you pick the wrong armed forces approach, you're going to really have a devastating uh, impact. So you're not going to want to mobilize your Navy if you're going to have a, an attack from, by land. And so, to the immune system, has to marshal the appropriate immune response to the appropriate pathogen uh, that's most effective for, the, for that pathogen. So, if you look at this cartoon, uh, this is kind of outlining which are the immune responses that are most effective against specific pathogens. And again, you know, this is done very black and white, but clearly it's not black and white. Immunology is a lot of gray zones, and just take that with a grain of salt. So, we're just saying what is felt to be the best response, but clearly other approaches play a role. So, again, here it's showing cytotoxic T cells play a critical role in killing virus-infected cells, and the pathogens that are targeted, viruses like the flu, rabies, as you know, HIV, and some intracellular bacteria. So an example would be TB. If TB escapes the vacuole and now is in the cytoplasm, bacterial proteins will be processed, presented into class 1 MHC molecule, and then that uh, cell will be killed. But uh, obviously, Antibodies also play an important role in viral infections as well, but in terms of T cell response, the cytotoxic T cells play a critical role. CD4 helper T cells play a critical role, as you again recall, in activating macrophages that have been ingested TB. TB is inside a vacuole. In the absence of activation, the macrophage won't be able to efficiently kill the TB, and therefore, it needs CD4 help. It's going to secrete, as you know, gamma interferon that's going to activate it to kill particularly intracellular bacteria. It's also, uh, again, plays a role in activating cytotoxic T cells. So, cytotoxic T cells are far more effective when they receive CD4 positive T cell help, and they become even more effective killers of uh, virus, virally infected cells because of, for example, interleukin-2 and other cytokines secreted by Th1 cells. So, in fact, one reason why as HIV progresses and individuals lose their CD4 positive T cells, the CTL response is diminished is because they don't have those CD4 T cells to keep revving them up and making them better, better killers. So, again, you can't think of cells in isolation. Uh, the uh, immune system is kind of like, I guess, a soccer team, uh, that it's a team. And even if you don't have your goalie, clearly you can have one issue. If you don't have your striker or forward or other plays, you can have other issues because everything has to work together. This is just showing what the major role of the individual player is, but again, keep in mind that it also interacts with other uh, players. CD4 positive Th2 cells, their major role is in stimulating humoral antibody response, and in particular, in particular, 
for, uh, the one that, again, take to the bank really is very highly demonstrated is its ability to stimulate IgE production. And again, as I'll discuss, Th2 cells make interleukin-4, which drives, as you, we learned yesterday, B cells to differentiate and recombine to produce IgE. And again, as we discussed yesterday, IgE binds to an FC receptor that's specific for IgE expressed on the surface of mast cells. And then when there's an infection with the parasite, cross-links those IgE antibodies in the mast cell surface, release all those mediators, and then you get sloughing off of the parasite by that very robust uh, inflammatory response. CD4 TH17 cells, again, a recently discovered subtype of T cells, those uh, seem to play an important role in extracellular bacteria. They're very important in mucosal immunity. We'll discuss this this afternoon in mucosal immunity, and they pretty much drive a neutrophil response. And so far in immunology, we haven't talked a lot about neutrophils, but clearly they're an important mediator cells, have very strong phagocytic activity, and, and TH17 are the particular subgroup of T cells that recruit that response. And finally, Treg cells. And Treg cells, mentioned yesterday, are the breaks of the immune system. If there's a very robust immune response, Treg cells come in and basically suppress T cell responses, again, because a too robust immune system may be destructive to tissue. So again, the same way you drive a car, have an accelerator, you have a brake. These cells are the accelerators, and the Treg cell is the brake. And you can imagine if you don't have Treg cells, it's like driving a car without a brake. Or, I mean, I'm from the Bronx, and that's baseline driving in the Bronx. People drive like they don't have any brakes, but that's another story. Now, CD4 positive T cells, uh, this is, start very simply. You basically start out with a naive CD4 T cell that is antigen specific. It's extremely naive. It has no idea what's ahead of him or her in terms of killing bacteria, uh, secre secreting cytokines. It now encounters antigen, MHC, peptide, TCR, gets co signals, gets interle interleukin-2, and now undergoes proliferation. So now you have millions of T cells. There's an antigen that they've, that's out there, an infection they have to respond to, but it's still immature. It hasn't yet committed in terms of which way it's going to mature. So one possibility is that it may mature into a Th1 cell, and again, I'll discuss in a few minutes what factors determine whether it matures along the Th1 lineage, and in that case, it's going to be able to, again, activate macrophages, and it'll, again, it'll talk about how it also does uh, induce opsonizing antibody. An alternate route that it could take is to mature into a Th2 cell. A Th2 cell is going to activate B cells to make neutralizing antibodies, in addition IgE, and we'll discuss again the functions in more detail, and also could d differentiate Th17 as well as Treg cell. But again, the, I just want to give you the caveat, this is a very simplistic way that I'm presenting it. Clearly a lot of things are happening at once, but again, in immunology you try to teach it simply, you understand the simple concepts, and then you can now start applying it in the more complex interactions that occur. So CD4 t and, 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 and CD8 cells differentiate along distinct pathways, have specific effects. So for example, cytotoxic T cell, MHC plus peptide, class 1, it'll kill the virally infected cell. That's what a CTL is going to do. Th1 cell, now illustrating what I showed in the previous slide, it, this is a macrophage. It has, it's ingested intracellular bacteria, again, to reiterate. If the bacteria is still in the vacuole, this is not considered an infected cell. It's taken it up. It can still cause fusion of phagolysosomes, kill the bacteria, and therefore everything is fine. In order to augment that process, this macrophage likes, will, will get T cell help from the Th1 cell, and therefore it will, will kill it. Again, to reiterate, if this bacteria escapes, from the vacuole into the cytoplasm, obviously you can't take a phagolysosome and slam it against the bacteria anymore, because then you destroy the cytoplasm. The, the vacuole is kind of like a stomach for the cell. You could throw all sorts of enzymes into it, and yet the cytoplasm is protected. And as you know, some bacteria, TB for example, listeria, have factors that allow it to escape the vacuole. But once it escapes the vacuole, again, peptides, derived from the bacteria can be presented in class 1, and now can be seen by a cytotoxic T cell, and it'll, it'll get killed. 
Th1 and, th and Th2 cells, the Th2 cells basically activate B cells. Here you see the antigen presenting cell to the Th2 cell is a B cell itself. It's trying to recruit help into itself, and that's going to allow it to secrete, uh, in this case, showing neutralizing antibodies, and later again also say IgE. Th17 cells can get activated by fibroblasts and epithelial cells. And they are induced, therefore, to secrete will turn out interleukin-17 that now causes recruitment of neutrophil into the area. Again, mucosal tissue, a good example, salmonella infection. And finally, Treg cells, they basically can be activated by immature dendritic cells. And again, I'll show you that in greater detail. And the effect of Treg cells is to turn off CD4 T cell function. Okay, any questions? So why... Uh, what defines what functions of these cells are? And the simplistic way of saying it is you are what you secrete. If you, you, the, the functional activity of cells is determined by the summation of the factors that it secretes. A question? So all these cells, it's a very good question. All, the question is, are T17, Treg cells, Th1, Th2, are they CD4 T cells? And the answer is yes. They're all subpopulations of CD4. And you're thinking, wait a minute, T regs are inhibiting the immune response, and we've learned CD4 cells are helper. It's a little counterintuitive that a, quote, helper cell is actually having suppressive activity. And the answer is yes, that is a subpopulation of T cells that does inhibit. And one could play the, you know, one could spin around and saying, you know, as a parent, you all know that sometimes you have to inhibit your kids as a way of actually in the big picture helping them. So maybe the Treg cell, even though it's inhibiting the response, the big picture, it's actually helping to have a balanced immune response that doesn't destroy self. Okay? So the, 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 you are what you secrete. So in this case for Th1 cells, the factors that it secretes are interleukin-2, and again, this just shows all the different things that interleukin-2 can do, but the major factor that I want to focus on is the fact that it stimulates T cell growth. At the last column is actually very informative because it illustrates what the phenotype of the knockout is in mice if you knock out that particular cytokine. And what actually was very surprising is that if you knock out interleukin-2, it's really not that dramatic you have some decreased T cell response, you have some autoimmune inflammatory bowel disease, but it's not as dramatic as one would have thought considering how important we thought IL-2 was for T cell function. Again, it illustrates why you need to do the experiment to see because there are other cytokines that could pick up the slack. Gamma interferon is probably the critical factor made by Th1 T cells. It has multiple effects. It does stimulate B cells to make IgE, in this case mouse 2A, it inhibits T cell growth. It activates cytotoxic T cells, as I mentioned before. In interleukin-2 also stimulates CTL proliferation. But the major activity of the gamma interferon is on macrophage function. It activates the macrophages, makes them better killers. It also upregulates class 1 and class 2 expression on the surface of macrophages, making them better antigen-presenting cells. It also activates co-stimulatory molecules. If you knock out gamma interferon, these mice are susceptible to mycobacteria, which makes sense because their macrophages can't kill them as efficiently, and also to some viruses because it lacks some of the antibody responses that are required to uh, facilitate immunity to these viruses. And finally, lymphotoxin, which is, is, is there, but it's not as w well described as the other cytokines, but its major activity is it activates uh, nitrous oxide production, and this plays a critical role in bacterial killing. If we now go to Th2 cells, the major cytokines that Th2 cells produce is interleukin-4 in terms of the proactive function of Th2 cells. Its major impact on B cells is production of IgG1, which is a neutralizing antibody that will bind to viruses and neutralize it. IgE, again, as I mentioned before, which plays a critical role in parasite immunity, it also upregulates class II expression to increase antigen presentation, and it actually functions as a growth factor for, for T cells, and I'll discuss it actually plays a role in polarizing T cells to Th2 polarity, 
it, it enhances the growth of mast cells, which actually makes sense. If you're going to make IgE, which is binding to mast cells, you also want to help make mast cells grow. And if you knock out interleukin-4, there are no TH2 responses, and you have a minimal uh, IgE production. So it's very dramatic phenotype, very susceptible to parasitic infections. Interleukin-5 is also a TH2 cytokine. It basically stimulates IgE uh, synthesis. It also enhances eosinophil growth and differentiation, and it also probably plays a critical role both in mucosal immunity as well as in parasitic infections. And finally, interleukin-2, it, it does have proactive effects in terms of stimulating class II MHC molecules, but its major effect seems to be inhibiting Th1 differentiation, and I'll discuss that in greater detail in a few minutes. Treg cells, the major cytokine they produce is TGF-beta, and TGF-beta inhibits growth of B cells, again, it's an inhibitory, so it's going to do a lot of inhibition. It inhibits T cell growth, inhibits activation of macrophages, it does activate neutrophils, and it inhibits other cells. And if you knock out the uh, uh, Treg phenotype, the, the mice actually die within uh, several weeks of age from these overwhelming autoimmune diseases because, again, you don't have the break. You can accelerate the car and just ultimately bang into something and total it. TH17, again, is an illustration of how immunologists want to be your friends. So they very easily could have called it, you have TH1 cells, TH2 cells, or actually are TH3 cells. They could have called it TH4 cells. Now, that would have been not very helpful to you because what cytokines do you think TH17 makes? IL-17. I mean, how, how much easier can it get than that? So therefore, they named it TH17 to really reinforce that it's making uh, interleukin-17. Uh, and the source uh, are CD4 positive T cells and the major effect, and again, you have to take this with a grain of salt because the knowledge of TH17 cells is still evolving, and this is a figure from 2008 textbook, so it's a little bit out of date, but I'm, I guarantee you that IL-17 also has impact on B cells and T cells, and macrophages may not yet have been discovered, and maybe some of the people in this room may be the people that will discover that. Recently, it's been shown that TH17 played an important role in HIV infection, again, may be very susceptible to being infected by HIV, uh, but the uh, major impact it has in st stimulation of neutrophil recruitment. It also uh, uh, stimulates fibroblasts and epithelial cells to secrete other chemokines to also further enhance in inflammation. Uh, one thing that also is known about interleukin-17 is it plays an important role in inflammatory bowel diseases and Crohn's disease, and in fact, that's why it's a subject of a lot of research to block this to potentially reverse those inflammatory bowel diseases. Okay, now, as I mentioned before, the function, again, is, is due to their differential cytokine production. So CD8 T cells, in addition to having fact, uh, cytotoxic effect due to secretion of perforin granzymes and expression of fast ligand, also secretes uh, the cytokines that play a role in its process. Now, people who experimentally want to analyze for cytotoxic T cell function do an L-spot assay. Anyone here do L-spot assay? Okay, what cytokine are you looking in your L-spot assay for? Interferon gamma. Interferon gamma, because activated cytotoxic T cells also secrete interferon gamma the same way that Th1 cells do. So in fact, that's why the reason you're not picking up Th1 cell reactivity in your assays is what are you stimulating your CD8 cells with? Um, peptide. peptide being presented by what? Well, what, you have to add a cell, an antigen presenting cell, and you're adding usually a cell line that's expressed in class 1 MHC. So it, that's why you're only focusing the response to CD8 cells. You're not adding a whole protein that can potentially get digested by a macrophage and presented in class 2 MHC molecules. Okay? So now, CD4 T cells, TH1 cells, again, as I mentioned, it does make multiple cytokines, but the one really want to focus on is gamma interferon because that's the one I'm going to be discussing in most detail and probably plays the most important role. TH2 cells, again, makes a host of cytokines. The ones I'm going to focus on predominantly are going to be interleukin-4 and interleukin-10. Just to make you aware, interleukin-13 has very, very similar overlapping activities with interleukin-4. 
and TH17 cells makes IL-17, also it turns out makes some IL-6 and, and some TNF, and Treg cells, the major player is going to be TGF-beta, which has significant suppressive activity on cytokines. It also makes interleukin-2 the same way Th2 cells do, and interleukin-2, again, as I'll discuss in a few minutes, is an inhibitory cytokine. Now, again, you have to ask the question, who cares? You know, why does it really matter whether you mount the appropriate immune response to a pathogen? Can it have implications if your immune system makes a mistake and mounts the, the wrong immune response? And what's very illustrative of this process is leprosy. So leprosy, has anyone here ever seen clinical leprosy? You've seen it? What, what kind did you see? The tuberculoid kind. Tuberculoid kind, okay. So, uh, as I'll discuss in a minute, the same exact bacteria can cause two very dramatically different phenotypic diseases. And this is an example of lepromatous leprosy, very dramatic uh, skin nodules, disseminated mycobacteria, devastating disease. Individuals lose uh, fingers, limbs. It's a, a really horrible, horrible disease. When you think of leprosy, this is the kind of disease that you're thinking about. However, the exact same bacteria can cause a very different, much more mild disease like the tuberculoid leprosy that you've seen. You have some, your patients have skin lesions mostly? Mostly skin lesions. Clearly, this doesn't look very dramatic. And th this is tuber tuberculoid leprosy. So the question is, why is it that exactly the same pathogen can cause two very distinct phenotypical diseases? You think the same pathogen should cause the same disease. It turns out that this is due to what kind of immune response the individual generates towards those, that pathogen. If it makes the right one, it does well, can contain it. And here is a pathological section from, from tubercular leprosy. In these, they have you could almost very few detectable levels of bacteria. They're not very infectious. They have a lot of granuloma and local inflammation, skin lesions. They have some peripheral nerve damage. That's a lot of toxicity. The levels of antibody are normal, and they have normal T cell responsiveness. In contrast, individuals that have lepromatous leprosy have large numbers of organisms growing through throughout, in, especially in macrophages, they're incredibly infectious because they have such a high bacterial load. They have disseminated infection, bone cartilage, and damage. They have hypergammaglobinemia. They have high levels of antibody, and they have low T cell responses. So who would want to wager? If you're infected with mycobacterial leprae, it's an intracellular bacteria. It gets taken up by macrophages. Who here would want to mount a Th1 response against mycobacterial leprosy? Raise your hand. Go ahead, Th1. Okay, who would want to mount a Th2 response against leprosy? Raise your hand. Okay, now we've got to get revved up. You've got to vote. You know, it's not like it's going to kill you if you vote wrong like it will for a patient. Okay, again, mycobacteria, intracellular pathogen, taken up by macrophages. Now think, if something's taken up by a macrophage, what cytokine would you want to secrete to rev up macrophage killing ability? What cytokine? Say it louder. Just yell it out. You know, give me some gamma interferon. Come on, wake up, right? Right? So what cytokine would you want to make? Come on, yell it out. Be, be, let's get it out here. Which, in, which cytokine? Okay, the front's good, the back is still, you know, embarrassed. Okay, so what subtype makes interferon gamma, Th1 or Th2? So who votes for Th1 if you're infected with mycobacterial leprae? Raise your hand. And who votes Th2? Raise your hand. See, you're not voting, you've got to vote. Late, I'll accept late votes. Th1, late vote. Okay? So now the body has to vote. The body can't sit on the sidelines and say, you know what, I can't decide, so I won't mount an immune response. That doesn't work. It turns out now, if you look at what cytokines are made in response to mycobacterial leprae, individuals that have 
tuberculoid leprosy are making IL-2, gamma interferon, TNF-beta, which are Th1 cytokines, not a lot, and, and the lepromatous leprosy patients, they're not making a lot of those Th1 cytokines. Most importantly, they're not making gamma interferon. However, patients that are, have lepromatous leprosy, they're making large amounts of IL-4, IL-5, and IL-10. So in essence, they've made the wrong choice because now they're making high levels of antibody. They're not making gamma interferon. Is antibody going to be very helpful for an intracellular bacteria? No. So they're making an immune response, but it's the wrong one. That's why the bacterial growth is not controlled, and that's why they have such devastating disease. If you mount the appropriate response, make a large amount of gamma interferon, activating macrophages, making them more effective killer cells, then you're able to control it very well. Is that clear? Does that make sense? So therefore, if you had a patient that had lepromatous leprosy, what cytokine would you consider giving that patient to rev up their immune system? Gamma interferon. Again, patient made a mistake. Let's help this patient. Okay. So now, to put it together now, Th1 cells, naive T cell, it becomes a Th1 cell. It's going to make gamma interferon, which is first going to activate macrophages, make them better killers. It's also going to make cytotoxic T cells more effective. And also, a kind of a simplistic view that, that some people may have is, well, Th1 is cellular immunity and Th2 is humoral immunity. However, Th1 cells also stimulate immunoglobulin production, predominantly IgG1. Why? Because as we learned yesterday, IgG1 can be very important in allowing opsonization of bacteria to induce an increased phagocytosis. Because now, this antibody will bind to the bacteria. The, the complex of antibody bacteria binds to the FC receptor on the surface of the macrophage, and now the macrophage ingests it far efficiently than in the absence of antibody, and this now synergizes with gamma interferon ability to now upregulate macrophage digestion. So again, this, this one-two punch of antibody plus activation of macrophage digestion, again, makes macrophages that much more effective. So you can imagine that if you're infected with mycobacteria leprosy, now you have antibodies that bind to it and again stimulate uh, optimization and elimination before it can infect other cells. Okay? Is that clear? And CD4 T cells make a broad range of cytokines. This is basically a list of them. And they have a broad range of activities, predominantly activating macrophages, increasing T cell proliferation, uh, and also increasing macrophage differentiation in the bone marrow. GMCSF is a critical macrophage growth factor that stimulates macrophage differentiation in the bone marrow. Well, you have an infection, you need macrophages to eliminate the infectious agent, maybe you're going to run out of them in the periphery, so you also want to go to the bone marrow and recruit more macrophages in the periphery. So again, it's a very uh, parallel approach of, again, enhancing the immune response. It also stimulates CCL2 secretion. CCL2 is a chemokine. Whenever you see either CC or CXC at the beginning of a, of a uh, compound, that refers to a chemokine. And again, it, it recruits macrophages to the site of infection, again, because that's what's going to be best in terms of eliminating the infectious agent. Th2 cells, naive T cell also differentiates into a Th2 cell. It basically makes interleukin-4 and interleukin-13, which are going to drive B cells to e either make IgE, which is going to bind to mast cells, uh, FC receptors on the surface of mast cells, where cross-linking will allow degranulation, and this is important for parasitic infections, particularly worms. And it also makes neutralizing antibodies, IgG1, which can just directly bind, for example, to viruses or toxins to neutralize them. And also stimulates IL-5, which, uh, again, upregulates IgA production and also stimulates eosinophil differentiation and activation. As I'll discuss in a minute, it also makes interleukin-2, which is, has an inhibitory effect on Th1 maturation. Now, why, what tells a cell whether to become a Th1 cell or a Th2 cell. You have this naive lymphocyte. It can go either direction. What sways it to go one way or the other? And it turns out it depends upon the cytokines that are secreted in the milieu in which this T cell is located. And 
If it's interleukin-12, and interleukin-12 can be made by dendritic cells or can be made by macrophages, this stimulates T cells to differentiate into the Th1 pathway. In contrast, if the T cell is exposed to interleukin-4, either made by NKT cells or actually made by other Th2 cells or made by mast cells, this now drives the cell to differentiate into a Th2 cell. So IL-12 made by macrophages as well as dendritic cells drive cells to become Th1, and interleukin-4 drives cells to become Th2. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. But in addition, it also may depend upon what cell is actually presenting antigen. If the antigen is being presented by macrophage, well, likely it's because the macrophage has taken up a bacteria, it's digesting and throwing up some peptides, it needs help digesting, so it's going to want to drive that T cell to, to help it, and it's going to want to drive it to make gamma interferon, and therefore it's going to drive it to become a Th1 cell by also secreting interleukin-12. A B cell, for example, one that wants to class switch into a IgE-producing B cell, if it presents antigen, it will, can secrete interleukin-4 and drive the helper T cell into becoming a Th2 helper T cell. Now, Treg versus Th17 are mediated by different cytokines. And if there's no infection going on, so that means that it's peacetime in the body. If it's peacetime in the body, do you want to be revving up immune responses? No, absolutely not. So if all your dendritic cells are immature, they're immature because there's no pathogens out there that are activating them. So in this case, the dendritic cells are making high levels of TGF-beta, and they're making very, very low levels of either IL-6 or IL-23, and therefore when a naive CD4 T cell is exposed to high TGF-beta, it's now stimulated to upregulate its expression of FOXP3, which, as you may know, is characteristic for Treg cells. It's, a, it's, it's present inside the nucleus transcription factor, and this now drives this T cell to become a Treg cell. And you could detect Treg cells by their expression both of the CD25 IL-2 receptor as well as FOXP3. And this Treg cell now has the capacity to inhibit both Th1 and Th2 cells. Okay, is that clear? And it makes sense. If there's no infection, no activation, you want to have cells that can damp down any residual inflammatory processes that are going on. However, if there is infection, and now the dendritic cell is activated by those infectious agents, now this dendritic cell is not only going to be making high levels of TGF-beta, but it's also going to be making high levels of interleukin-6 and interleukin-23, and now this is going to drive this naive CD4 T cell in a different direction. If there's infection, do you want Treg cells to be generated? No, because you don't want to basically uh, damp down an appropriate immune response. That would be devastating. And therefore, now you drive the CD4 positive T cell to differentiate into a Th17 cell. And the characteristic transcription factor that's expressed by Th17 cells is ROR gamma T plus. And this now drives the, the cell to make interleukin-17, which ultimately is going to stimulate, in this case, neutrophil, neutrophilic uh, in, uh, influx. Now, this balance of Treg and Th17 is particularly important in mucosal tissue. Because in the absence of, of infection, you basically don't want to have inflammatory processes in the gut. You need to have uh, Treg cells. If there is infection, though, now you want to mount an inflammatory response, and then you shift over to a Th17 response. Okay, is that clear? Now, a question. Sorry, just a question. Is it always in just producing high TGF all the time? So apparently it seems, yes, a great question. Is the, are dendritic cells always producing high TGF beta at the same time? I can't give you, you know, a definitive answer that every dendritic cell is making high TGF all the time. But apparently there are subpopulations of resting dendritic cells that make high levels of TGF-beta enough to drive this differentiation to go on. Okay, excellent question. Okay, so now 
again, you, you ask for more signal transduction, and I try to be responsive to students. So uh, this is just kind of review signal transduction. But if you recall, one of the factors is NFAT. And when NFAT is phosphorylated, it's stuck in the nucleus. When NFAT is dephosphorylated, it now can go into the nucleus. I'm sorry, phosphorylated NFAT is stuck in the cytoplasm. It can't get into the nucleus. If you dephosphorylate it, it can now move into the nucleus, bind to its appropriate transcription site, and activate the appropriate genes. It turns out that there's more than one flavor of NFAT. There are actually at least four different types of NFAT. Each one of those different types binds to a different subpopulation of genes, turning on a different population of cytokines. And it turns out that NFAT ATC1, and these are the ones I just want to focus on, this particular one mediates the interleukin 4 TH2 response. And this particular one mediates gamma interferon TH1 responses. So in addition to cytokine, to, to, uh, to the extraneous IL-12 versus IL-4, there's also a subpopulation of NFAT. If this is generated, then the T cell will be differentiated into IL-4, TH2. If this NFAT is stimulated after antigen presentation, then this T cell will differentiate into TH1 responses. Now, a question is, how does the T cell know which NFAT to make? It turns out that it depends upon the antigenic load that's out there. If you have a high antigenic load, which means you're going to cross-link a large number of T cell receptors, that seems to drive a TH1 response, likely because that strong signal probably turns on this particular NFAT. However, if it's a low antigenic load, not a lot of the antigen out there, that seems you, you can only cross-link a very few number of T cell receptors, a weaker signal, and that seems particularly to drive IL-4, TH1. So again, another paradigm that you'll hear about why you get a TH1 and why you get a TH2 is dependent upon the antigenic load. High antigenic load makes sense. Think of a bacterial infection. Large number of bacteria, a lot of antigen out there, that's going to give you a TH1 response. Parasites tend to have a much lower shedding of antigen. Think about allergies. Allergens like pollen. Not a lot of pollen out there. That will drive a TH2 response. Okay? Now, I always say that the immune response is like a political campaign. And I know uh, here in South Africa, you also have pol there's a, an election coming up soon, right? Yeah. Yeah. In about five years. In about five years, okay. <laughs> well, there's always elections. It's probably local people running for office, right? So whenever you have a, an election, the first thing that the candidates always do is they say how great they are, right? You know, and, and it, they say the same thing everywhere. They're going to help the economy. They're going to increase jobs. They're going to, you know, the usual campaign thing, right? What else do they say here in South Africa? Housing. How, increased housing. And what else? Increase what? The, the decrease crime. Oh, decrease crime. Right. I mean, what, who could be against that, right? But, but what's the problem with that approach? The problem with that approach is that everyone says it. So you can't decide who to vote for based on what they say. So of course you say, well, this person really is honest, this person will pro is, is very competent, and maybe he'll do or she'll do what they say, and the other person is lying through their teeth, but it's hard for you to, to, to tell that. So what do candidates do to convince you to vote for them? What else do they tell you? What? The other's are bad. The other's bad, exactly. Like, the other person is a liar, a thief, he cheats on his wife, you know, a whole list of the usual, you know, they'll show pictures of that person, like, they never showed up to any meetings, or the person's lazy, or they'll show, you know, they go on junkets outside of the country all the time, you know, they may or may not be true, but now you see that and say, I'm not voting for that person, because this, you know, has all these bad things about them, and in fact, whenever a campaign gets close, that's what candidates tend to do. They shift from being very positive to being negative on their opponent. And then things get really nasty, right? So unfortunately, the immune system does exactly the same thing. It sinks to that same level. So initially, it tries to have a positive message. Th1 cells will say, 
I'm secreting interleukin-12, join the Th1 team, that's the appropriate immune response. Th2 cells are saying, I'll secrete interleukin-4, come be a Th2 cell, that's the appropriate response. But then if things get desperate and the naive T cells who don't know much may not be taking that positive message, or Th17 cells may not take the positive message, now they go negative. And the way they go negative is by secreting cytokines that actually inhibit differentiation in alternative pathways. So here, in this case, Th2 cells secrete interleukin-10, and in interleukin-10 are basically going to prevent uh, interleukin-12 production and therefore prevent Th1 differentiation. And, Th and in this case here, uh, interleukin-4 also inhibits Th17 differentiation, whereas Th1 cells make gamma interferon, and gamma interferon blocks Th2 differentiation and also dif blocks Th17 differentiation. And Treg cells make TGF-beta, and TGF-beta basically blocks Th1 versus Th2 differentiation. So in addition to having a positive message, you also have a negative message to particularly polarize T cell differentiation to their own particular pathway. Okay, is that clear? Does that make sense? Okay, and it turns out that this is important because you have to visualize immune response in the context of a tissue. So let's say you have a person who's infected with a parasite. What kind of immune response are they going to be generating? Who here says Th2? Raise your hand. Just go for it. Okay? Who says Th1? Raise your hand. No, it's going to be Th2, right? So now that same person gets infected with mycobacterial leprae. What's going to happen? Well, they're having a Th2 polarized response. They may be making large amounts of interleukin-10, which is suppressing Th1, so that may be a reason why individuals may make the wrong immune response, because another pathogen that they're infected with may polarize them the wrong way. It's hard for Th1 differentiation to occur in an environment where we have large amounts of interleukin-10 being made. So if you're infected with multiple parasites, that may polarize you the wrong way. And it's not that the immune system is stupid and doesn't know that mycobacterial le le uh, leprae requires Th1. It may be that it's just a victim of its environment and it can't overcome that. Okay, so no matter how much positive signals it provides to go Th1, it's thwarted by the pre-existing polarization to Th2. And the same thing can happen the opposite. You have a very strong Th1 response, you're infected with mycobacterial leprae. You polarize Th1, now you get infected with the parasite, you can't shift to Th2, the appropriate response. Is that clear? And that's why co-infection could have very uh, important effects on altering the immune response. And again, some of you are familiar with now HIV TB co-infection, and the question is what impact that has on your ability to fight either pathogen. Okay, so T cell response, t uh, stimulation, proliferation, and effector, so the cri cri critical role is played by cytokines. And cytokines, in order for them to activate a cell, has to bind to a receptor. And the basic receptor that we're going to be focusing on are heterodimeric receptors that basically consist of either two or three chains that are combined when the cytokine binds to that particular uh, receptor. And as I mentioned previously, interleukin-2 actually turns out to have three receptors. A gamma-beta heterodimer can give you moderate affinity and, and induce signal transduction. By having the third alpha chain, now you can switch to a high affinity receptor. And again, as I showed you previously, the moderate affinity interleukin-2 receptor requires high amounts of interleukin-2 to be activated. And one could imagine, in a very vigorous infection, you have a lot of interleukin-2 being made, and that's one way of recruiting T cells in the face of a really severe infection. It's like not a time to go through this very careful checks of, of activation, antigen presentation, MHC2. This is like an all-hands emergency for the immune system. You want all the T cells to get activated, and that's what high IL-2 will do. A normal situation, you, you want to have the appropriate checks, so therefore only low-level interleukin-2 will activate a T cell if the infection is relatively, is not that dramatically severe. Okay, so signal transduction by cytokines. Well, I have good news for you. 
because instead of this complicated process that T cells use for T cell receptor transduction, cytokine transduction is actually quite straightforward and simple. It only requires you to know two families of proteins. And those families, the first member, as you recall, if a receptor molecule itself doesn't have an intrinsic cytokine, a, a single transduction molecule, it tends to have one bound to it. And for cytokines, it turns out it's a family of molecules called JAKs. And these JAKs are located on the heterodimeric chains. Again, the same motif as yesterday. When the chains are separate, these can't interact with each other. Nothing happens. However, the cytokine comes, it binds to both of these chains, brings them together, and now the two JAKs can interact. And as you can tell, these two JAKs are slightly different color, which means that it's not just one JAK, there's a family of different JAK molecules, and they can have different JAKs on one chain, different ones on a different chain. Now they interact, and what do you think they're doing to each other and to the chain? What kind of, what's happening? What process? Phosphorylation, which is indicated by this little purple dots, now that this phosphorylated, it can recruit from the cytoplasm another family of transduction molecules called STATs. And now these STATs get recruited to the cytokine receptor. Now these STATs phosphorylate each other. Now that STATs are phosphorylated, they can form heterodimers. And single chain STATs are limited to being in the nucleus. Once you form a heterodimer, they now can migrate into the nucleus where they can bind to the appropriate target genes and turn on genes. That's it. Jack stat, fine. Now, I mean, teleologically, why do you think cytokine signal transduction is so simple, whereas T cell is so complicated? Well, a quick response, but also think about I, how much cytokines do you think you have compared to how many MHC plus peptides you're going to see? Make cytokines, there's a lot of cytokine out there, so it's probably going to interact with a lot of receptors at the same time. So that individual receptor probably doesn't have to do a lot of amplification. But a T cell receptor may only be activating a handful of molecules, therefore it has to have a high level of amplification, and that's why you need that much more complicated system to give you that high level of amplification. Okay, any questions? Okay, question. One thing on the, on the Tregs and the, the inhibition, the inhibitory molecules you were talking about earlier, uh, one slide back, yeah. The one, is, is, does anything inhibit Tregs? Because I was thinking of autoimmunity in, in the context. I mean, that seems to be the only one that doesn't, in that picture, have something that negatively stimulates. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, what inhibits Tregs? Um, I, I, I suspect that there is one, but I actually don't know the answer. And, and, and Janeway, at this point, didn't know the answer either. But I suspect if you looked in the literature right now, you would find a definitive answer. Because one thing you, you have to know is always a, a negative. OK, so now a question that you should have asked is, how many cytokines do you have? I mean, you don't have to give me an exact answer. Do you have a few cytokines or a lot of cytokines? A lot, a lot of cytokines. Well, the question is, you know, how does the cell know? I mean, you have two molecules here, families. How do you, IL-2 give you one effect, IL-4 another effect, IL-12 another effect. How do you get that specificity with this system of basically just two families of signal transduction molecules, right? Is that a reasonable question? Well, it turns out that there's a lot of stats and there's a lot of jacks. And this is what provides the specificity for the immune response. And it turns out that for for interleukin-12, its effect is driven by STAT4, and interleukin-4, its, its, its effect is driven by STAT because each one of these STATs is going to recruit a different JAK, and that JAK is going to turn on a different family of genes. So bound to the receptor for interleukin-12 is going to be STAT4, bound to the receptor for IL-5 is going to be STAT6, and that's what gives you the specificity. The different JAKs, different STATs associated with the different cytokine receptors, and that these JAKs, different JAKs, are going to, are going to bind to different uh, transcription factors, and it's transcription sites that turn on different genes. So now if you put it into context of the TH, 
of the Th1 response, you basically have interleukin-12 being produced, and what interleukin-12 does is it turns on STAT4, and that's now going to drive Th1 differentiation. Interleukin-4 is going to bind to its receptor, turn on STAT6, and drive Th2 differentiation. And years ago, uh, a student in my class t told me that an easy way of remembering it is he calls it the rule of 48. And what you basically do is do Th1 cell times 12 times 4 is 48. Th2 cell times 4 times 6, so 4 times 2 is 8, 8 times 6 is 48. So that's an easy way of remembering which stat is Th1 and which stat is, is Th2. Just remember rule of 48. And again, the way Americans can remember that is up until Hawaii and Alaska joined the Union, I guess in the 50s, there were only 48 states. So that's how you kind of maybe remember the 48. Okay, the other way of remembering is just multiply 12 times 4, and that's 48. Okay, uh, so, so the immune response, the temporal course, basically shows you, you establish infection, you induce the adaptive response, and this indicates how much antigen is required to activate the immune system. No antigen, no infection, no activation of the immune system. The bacteria start replicating, it comes in, starts replicating, greater antigenic load. Now you induce the adaptive immune response, you have the adaptive immune response, get rid of the infection, you clear it, and ultimately the pathogen is cleared, and now at this stage is when you want to generate immunological memory. You want to remember that you have been infected with this pathogen because the second, third, fourth times, you want to mount a much more vigorous and rapid immune response because you don't want to get infected. And therefore, therefore, in this system, some effector T cells become memory T cells. And the way this happens is you have antigen-presenting cell TCR, naive T cell encounters antigen, most activated T cells become effector cells. Makes sense. You want to clear the infection. Doesn't do you any good to remember you've had the infection if, you, if you're killed because you didn't mount a good immune response. So you, most of them become effector, but a small fraction of those become long-lived memory cells. And IL-7 and IL-15 apparently play a critical role in terms of allowing these memory cells to survive. And they also continuously like to be exposed to MHC plus peptide, but it could get low-level stimulation from self-peptide. And these memory T cells can live for decades. They, if you're infected a second time, not only are they there, but they're also hardwired to be a much more rapidly responsive cell. Whereas naive T cells say antigen, it takes a while for them to undergo uh, proliferation activation. Memory T cells have like this hair trigger. They rapidly respond because their transduction pathways are rewired. Again, explaining now why when you get infected the first time, you mount an immune response, but you have a bad infection. The second time, you basically mount a rapid immune response, you may get a very mild infection, and perhaps the third time, you basically don't even notice that you're infected because you mount this very, very rapid, focused, significant immune response. That's why you pretty much get sick once from uh, most infections, and you don't ever get sick again. Okay, any questions? Yeah. response that you still, you know, don't have a good immune system because probably you're losing your memory cells. Yeah, so they're more likely or less likely to be infected in that sort of memory state when they are a bit quiet. Yeah, it's system. a great question. I mean, the, the question is, uh, when we give patients heart, for example, the CD4 cells go up. Well, that, that's great. But on the other hand, the question you have to ask is, who are those CD4 T cells? And as, if, if, as you pointed out, HIV's knocked out these memory T cells, we all know that memories are not earned very easily. You have to go through the whole process experientially. And if HIV seems, there are, are reports that it potentially targets memory T cells. One reason may be that memory T cells may express higher levels of CCR5, for example, and be more susceptible to being eliminated by HIV. But now that means that if you're exposed to a pathogen that previously you would have mounted a very good, robust response because your memory T cells are there, you may now almost have to relearn immunity to a degree, and therefore it'll take a while to get reconstituted. 
So it's an excellent point. Just because the CD4 T cells go back up to previous levels does not mean qualitatively the immune response is equivalent to the way it was before. For, for the point that you're making, because you're wiping out these memory T cells. So uh, it turns out that there are two types of memory cells, and again, this is relevant to HIV because this has been addressed in terms of what memory cells may be preferentially wiped out in HIV infection, and they're basically either central memory cells or effective memory cells, and you basically have dissemination of effector lymphocytes throughout the uh, lymphoid system in the gut, and so some of the memory T cells may be directly generated after the infection occurs from naive T cells. Another fraction of them may be derived from effector T cells that then can differentiate into memory cells. But the two types of memory cells that you'll hear about are central memory cells and effector memory cells. And the difference between the two depends upon their expression of CCR7. Remember, if you express CCR7, where are you going to migrate it to? CCR7. Remember, dendritic cells in the periphery of Langerhan cells, C antigen, now express CCR7, where do they migrate to? To lymph nodes. So too, if these memory, if these memory cells express CCR7, where are they going to migrate to? To lymph nodes. And that's why central memory cells express CCR7 and they remain in the lymphoid tissue. Why? Because that's where antigen is going to come the next time you're infected. That's where you want your memory cells to be. But in addition, we also want to have frontline memory cells that potentially can be rapid responders. You don't have to worry about these cells being self-reactive because they've already been appropriately activated, so you don't mind having these cells in the periphery because they're not going to start attacking self because they're antigen specificities to a pathogen. And therefore, these cells lack CCR7. They won't, therefore don't home to the lymph node. They're migrate to the tissues where they can therefore be frontline T cells the next time you're infected. Another reason why you mount a much more rapid response the second time you're, or third time you're infected because you have these peripheral memory T cells. Okay, is that clear? Okay, original antigenic sin is a very uh, cool concept. Uh, it, whenever you want to, you know, give something a good name, right? Original antigenic sin. So the idea is, is that the first time that a person can be infected with a virus, and this is really known very well for influenza, the, this flu virus has a large number of antigens, and each antigen is indicated by a different color. As you know, the flu mutates frequently and therefore expresses different proteins. So the next time a person's infected, they'll be infected with a different strain of influenza. And that different strain has different, some different proteins, and some have the same proteins as the original flu virus. Now, you would think that the second time that you're infected, you would make antibodies to all of the flu proteins, right? Wouldn't that make sense? It turns out that that's not the case. Your immune system basically says, oh, I recognize that protein, I recognize that protein from the previous infection, and therefore only makes antibodies to the old antigens that it's seen before. It ignores the new antigens. That's called original antigenic sin, namely the immune response tends to respond to the antigen that it's seen previously, and it, it ignores new antigens when they're presented at the same time. Well, now it actually makes sense because what cells are responding to the old antigen? What kind of cells? What type? Memory cells. They're fast, they're rapid, they're there, so therefore it's going to happen quickly. They're going to bind, clear the antigen, and probably prevent the whole long process of making new immune responses against the antigens that you've never seen. Again, you're infected 20 years later with another strain of of flu, your memory is so strong that you'll ignore the new antigens and you'll only make antibodies against the one that you may have seen 20 years ago. And the reason that's potential that you were immunized with, and this is a, a critical limitation of the immune system in terms of its inability to diversify beyond what it's seen earlier. 
Okay, and, and th this is just to show you M cells, and again, I'm going to discuss, discuss this this afternoon in the mucosal lecture, so I'm just going to just skip that, and now basically summarize how do CD4 T cells or orchestrate responses appropriate to the infecting pathogen by differentiating into the appropriate subtype making the appropriate cytokines, how does CD4 positive T cell differentiate appropriately Th1, Th2, or Th17, Treg, depending upon positive cytokine signals that are specific for it and negative signals that prevent differentiation into alternative pathways? And finally, how do diverse cytokines transmit signals that mediate diversion responses by using JAK stats and different families of JAKs interacting with different families of stats that bind to different gene families? Okay? So then have a good lunch. I'll come back and we'll start talking about mucosal immunity. Again, thanks a lot for your attention.